Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Amir Zanadipur from the Institute of High Voltage and High Current, a School of Electrical Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, University Technology, Malaysia. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Nicolas Antonio Cotololis from the Technical University of Denmark to accept our invitation and uh, attend to this webinar as a speaker to share the knowledge, expertise, and experience. We are very fortunate and grateful to have the webinar with the Professor Nicolas in our 81 Distinguished Lecture Series. Professor Nicolas will deliver the lecture which is entitled The Basic Concept in the Wind Energy Today. It's a pleasure we have the made collaboration with the Technical University of Denmark by the Professor Nicolas and hopefully keep this collaboration in the future. This section held by the Faculty of Engineering under the organization by Professor Tatu Engineer Mohammad Rafir, the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, UTM. Without any delay, I would like to hand the section to Professor Mohammad to introduce Professor Nicholas. Over to you, Prof. Mohammad. Thank you, Dr. Amir Reza. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome to our 81st Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Mohammad Rafiq and I am the Dean of Engineering University Technology Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Nikolaus Antonio Kutuludis from Technical University of Denmark. Right, a bit about our distinguished speaker today. Nikolaus Kutuludis is Professor in Offshore Wind Power Integration based in the Department of Wind Energy at the Technical University of Denmark. He holds an MSc in 1998 and a PhD in 2005 in automat automatic control. He is a management board member for the European Energy Research Alliance, EERA, joint program WIN, coordinating the sub-program on system integration of wind power and a member of the European Technology Platform on WIN, ETIP WINS, executive committee and represents Denmark in IEA wind task 25. This research area is integration and operation of wind power moving towards 100% RES power systems with a special focus on offshore wind and HVDC, low inertia systems and converter based systems. He has co-authored more than 200 manuscripts in his research fields and he acts as associate guest editor for IET and IEEE journals. So that is a brief biography of our distinguished speaker today. Here now is Professor Nikolaus Kutululis from Technical University of Denmark on the basic concepts of wind energy. Professor Nikolaus Kutululis, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Afik and, uh, and Amireza. Thank you very much for the invitation to, 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 to participate in your uh, uh, lecture series. And I'll, um, I'm very glad to, give, to be given the opportunity to uh, talk a bit about uh, wind power and why we think it's, uh, it's so nice and so important. I will try to share my screen. Uh, hope you can see it. Yes, yes, good. So, uh, uh, yeah, as I said, I will I will try to 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 introduce a bit the wind power basics and maybe uh, uh, given my background more on the electrical part of wind to to also touch upon the the how how wind power is uh, impacting the power system operation. So, the brief the agenda for this uh, presentation, I will. Uh, briefly present where I come from or where I sit and uh, uh, and work. Uh, by the way, this is a very nice picture. The weather doesn't look exactly like that this morning in a, in a very great Denmark, but uh, uh, I'll talk about a bit about our department. Then I will try to briefly introduce the history of wind power developments and talk on uh, about wind turbines, wind power plants, and what are the trends when it comes to, uh, uh, to wind power integration. So, um, I was already introduced, but just to uh, to give a very brief um, uh, a little about me, also to to kind of uh, introduce uh, some of my colleagues and the groups that uh, that I'm working with, because uh, a lot of those things I'm going to talk about are the research we are doing in in wind power integration. It's of course not done only by myself, but with a large group. And as I said, I have a background in automatic control and start being 
doing research in wind power for more than 20 years now, starting with uh, with a PhD in wind turbine electrical control. But uh, after that, I've um, I've moved more to the system level uh, of wind now, being uh, focusing a lot on uh, offshore wind technology, offshore grids, uh, HVDC transmissions, and so on aspects related to uh, to offshore wind power um, uh, development. I'm not Danish, but I live in Denmark. I've been living in Denmark for, for many years. And in many ways, Denmark is uh, the country for wind energy or one of the countries for wind energy because uh, wind uh, means a lot to Denmark. Uh, also in the industrial uh, sector with uh, very large numbers for Denmark, maybe the, the numbers itself are not very large compared to for, for countries which which are much larger than Denmark. But in Denmark, wind is a, is, is, is a big um, is a big thing, if I can say so. And Denmark, it's also the country with the highest share of, of wind energy in its electricity demand. I think we've had uh, uh, more than 40% of the demand in 2018 was covered by wind and uh, everything shows that for 2020 we are well on the way to 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 exceed 50% of uh, electricity demand and of course uh, Denmark is not only very good in uh, or, or in industry or in wind turbine industry, but it's also uh, very strong in, in education and research about wind. And uh, my department, DTU Wind Energy, is a department in the Technical University of Denmark. And we were founded um, uh, more than 40, 40 years ago in Denmark. And uh, we are a fairly large university department with uh, around 20, 250 employees and we do we are doing uh, of course research education and providing scientific advice in the in the area of wind energy and our organization the way we are organized is in three divisions wind energy systems wind turbine technology and structure and material and components and for someone who is uh, very familiar with universities uh, uh, setups we we'll probably already noticed that we are a bit different because we are not really discipline oriented, but we are subject oriented. So we are having all the the disciplines that are needed in a in a complex and uh, uh, in a complex topic like wind energy. Uh, in Denmark, we are we have uh, three main sites where we operate. Uh, we have two uh, large test sites for for wind turbines uh, on the west coast of Denmark, which is very close to offshore. Here are some of the largest wind turbines today. Prototypes are being uh, erected and, uh, and tested. And then we have two campuses, uh, the main campus of the Danish Technical University, uh, very close to Copenhagen, the, the capital of Denmark, where most of our or all of our teaching is done. And then we have the uh, research site where I'm, I'm sitting right now, where is the, the research site where most of the people are sitting and, and doing the and, and doing research. And we have a lot of uh, research facilities. You can see here a picture of our large scale test lab where uh, wind turbine blades up to 40 or 45 meters length are can be tested for uh, for all kind of structural uh, structural properties. So as I said, we are we are um, organized in three divisions, and uh, very briefly, I will introduce uh, the wind energy systems division first, uh, which is as the as the name uh, uh, indicates, is um, is mostly looking at the wind power as a system or the, at the system level, and we are uh, having from wind resource assessment, which is uh, a very global uh, uh, thing, to uh, aspects which are less, less technical but more related to society, market, and policies. And of course, everything in between with, uh, from my perspective, a big focus on the grid integration part, which is the section that I uh, I sit in and where, where we are doing the, our research. And we are, where we are, of course, focusing on the electrical system design, uh, grid integration, control of wind power, and uh, and so on. Very briefly, the other two divisions, one is the wind turbine design division, as the name uh, indicates, is doing everything that is related with, with single wind turbine uh, development, uh, testing from uh, rotor and airfoil design to testing and calibration uh, units. You can see maybe here in the small picture, a LiDAR system deployed in one of the offshore wind farms. So LiDAR system for use to measure, uh, to measure wind speeds around the wind turbines on the wind farm. 
And finally, the third uh, uh, division, which is structural materials and components division. So going a bit from system level to wind turbine level and down to more components level where uh, aspects like mechanics and analysis of materials, manufacturing uh, and testing of composites materials, which are very, very much used in um, in wind turbines, uh, mostly in uh, uh, towers and blades, but also for structural design and testing and uh, towards uh, structure integrity and load applications parts. So uh, um, this is how our our department is uh, is organized, and we are covering the whole spectrum or the whole space of uh, of wind energy research and um, and education. And uh, talking about education, uh, uh, besides the um, besides the normal um, um, education that the university provides with face-to-face -face classes and uh, and so on at all levels, from bachelor level to to master of science level and PhD level, we also have a number of uh, trainings and courses for continued education, which are. Uh, especially in these times, provided uh, uh, mostly online. And we have the, the basic level, the free uh, training in basic in wind energy, which is done through the MOOC, massive online open courses uh, from, uh, from our department. You can find them in the Coursera.org website. Then we have a second level, which is hands-on level, uh, uh, teaching and, and uh, training on, on different aspects of wind and different uh, tools and methods that we are, have developed in, uh, in, the, um, in our department. And not least, we have a fully online master of uh, wind energy. You can have, the, you see the, uh, the link here for people that uh, aim, aimed mostly at people that already had, uh, had an education in a different area and they are mostly wanting to change career or to come closer to learn more about wind or, or things like that. So if everybody, anybody is interested in that, uh, you, can, um, you can visit uh, the slides. So this is a bit very briefly about uh, where I come from. Uh, if we go back to the, to the topic of this, uh, of this uh, lecture on wind power, um, of the, the global image of wind power today, and by today I mean the 2019, at the end of 2019, uh, was that we have an, uh, uh, a global installed capacity of total installations of wind, both onshore and offshore, of around 651 um, uh, um, gigawatts. Uh, and you can see here i think what is uh, what is interesting is the, the the pace with which the development is uh, is happening uh, it has slowed down a bit from from the very early years that are mentioned here but wind power is still developing fairly uh, fairly strong and as i said we have around 650 gigawatts of wind power installed worldwide and uh, because sometimes uh, you know numbers like that don't mean much without a context around it. I also put here the, 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 the total electricity installed capacity in the EU countries. It's around uh, um, 1,000 gigawatts. So I think at the, at the global level, we have a bit more than, than half of the, of the capacity that is installed in, in uh, EU right now, which is not bad of course, for, for wind, which has been developing only in the last few decades, but it's also still um, a long way that we need to, uh, to, to continue uh, trying to move towards uh, fully, hopefully, renewable energy systems. But how we get here? Uh, I think uh, maybe uh, some of you know uh, wind, uh, wind energy has been there for many, many, many centuries. But uh, wind power in, in terms of wind turbines is something that uh, uh, Took off uh, in the in the seventies, um, uh, uh, in the previous nineteen um, seventies, especially uh, when we have the oil oil crisis. And in that period, uh, different concepts were tested. You can see here pictures from uh, uh, from different um, concepts that were tested. I think uh, what is maybe interesting mentioning is that all of them, if I'm not very wrong, were actually tested in, in our site where I sit now at RISO in Denmark. So this has been also a very nice pioneering place for, for developing wind turbine concepts. And while this has, uh, has happened, different concepts from vertical axis wind turbines to horizontal axis wind turbines, and it's with even one blade, two blades, uh, uh, three blades or multi-blade like, like this one. So different concepts uh, have been tested, but fairly 
fairly early uh, uh, in in the wind development, the the concept that prevailed was, um, and it's still uh, used today, is the uh, the horizontal axis three. Uh, bladed wind turbine, and you can see here in different uh, um, in different uh, uh, in different uh, uh, stages of development over the over the time. And the last picture here is actually uh, the the wind turbines that we have here at site in um, in Denmark, uh, installed today in our in our research uh, uh, field uh, in our in, on our campus. So. If I would like to be a bit um, a bit provocative, I would say that uh, actually, from a, from a certain perspective, wind turbines have not really changed very much over the years. You can see here a, a number of pictures of Vestas wind turbines over over the time, uh, going from the from the 70s in to uh, uh, to the this decade that we are we are into, and you can all see that as I said before, the um, the main concept has remained the same. Of course, a lot of a lot of changes can have happened in the shape of the blades from this one to the to the blades of today. But as a principle, um, the the main concept has not really changed over the year, at least when you look from from outside to a wind turbine. But uh, if we look a little closer or a little more inside the wind turbines, we have actually different wind turbine types. Uh, and um, this classification I'm showing you now, it's it's based on the on the grid connection part of the wind turbine, so the part of the wind turbines that is connected to the grid. And then we have the type one wind turbine, which is the single cage wind turbine generator, and type two, which is pretty much the same as type one, but it has a, a variable uh, a rotor resistance uh, uh, included, so we can have a little of, of a variable speed operation. And this, the main characteristic of these two types of wind turbines is that they are directly connected to the grid, uh, pretty much like a synchronous generator. But that means also that the rotational speed of the wind turbines is locked to the grid frequency, and that also um, that also has uh, some disadvantages, which uh, are mostly related to the fact that the wind turbines rotational or the generator rotational speed is really driven by the by the grid frequency and not by the by the wind speed. And I will get back to that why why this was very good in the beginning. Uh, I think this type of wind turbines are known as uh, as the Danish concept, which was simple, reliable, and fairly cheap back then. So important for the development of wind power, but uh, still um, were not uh, very good for for large uh, for large wind turbines. Uh, so then we have the variable speed wind turbines, the, the so-called type three uh, wind turbine, which is the double fed wind turbine generator, and type four. And the difference between those two is coming on the on the power electronics. Uh, how much power electronics um, or the sizing of the of the power electronic converters used to connect to the grid so in type 3 you have the the wind turbine the, the power electronic is uh, has only a fraction of the of the rating of the wind turbine while in uh, type 4 is full power converter so the full power produced by the wind turbine is is connected to the grid through the power electronics and this is it's been very important for wind turbines because it it decouples the operation of the wind turbine from the from the grid, which allows for the for the wind turbine control and operation to be uh, done based on the on the wind speed. Um, so maximum power at extraction at all wind speeds, but also you can allevi alleviate the loads on the wind turbine by by operating it in different uh, in different speeds. And today, virtually all wind turbines today are some kind of a variable speed with especially the very large ones being uh, typically type 4 uh, wind turbines with full power converter. Yeah, very briefly, uh, if we go a little bit inside the wind turbine, uh, the wind turbine are uh, complex, large, sophisticated machines with a lot of components. I will not go very much through it, but the main ones are, are the, um, you have the rotor hub where you have the, the blades and the, and the spinner. Then we have the main shaft, which is... Uh, um, of course, maybe I didn't say that, but uh, I thought uh, it's very obvious that the main role of a wind turbine is to convert the kinetic energy in the wind speed into first mechanical energy in the shaft of the wind turbine and then into electrical energy through the through the generator and then feed that into the grid or the load or whatever whatever it is that the wind turbine is feeding. So uh, we have the the rotor hub of the of the wind turbine with the blades. 
then we have the main shaft and then uh, you can have or not a, a gearbox and then the, the the gearbox here and then the electrical generator and of course there is a lot of a lot of components when we are connecting to the grid with the transformers the switch gears and uh, and so on to to connect uh, a main point in wind turbines is uh, the gearbox which is uh, um, which is uh, accelerating or or trying to to match the the this rotational speed of the rotor hub which is typically fairly slow to the high rotational speed that uh, gener electrical generators uh, uh, require but uh, one concept or, or one concept is to have a gearbox and the second one is to have direct drive wind turbines without a gearbox that are typically employing uh, uh, synchronous generators, uh, permanent magnet uh, uh, synchronous generators. And this has uh, the advantage of not having a gearbox, uh, which mechanically is one of the components that uh, takes on most of the stress and the loads in a, in a wind turbine, but then that means that you have a, a typically a multiple synchronous generator, which is uh, kind of much larger than uh, than um, a normal generator. You can see here a drawing of the Heliade X to 12 megawatts. I think today they, they, they also run it to 30 megawatts, but what is considered one of the largest wind turbines today, if not the largest, and I think it's always Bit amazing to look at the scale of, of such a wind turbine you have here the nacelle of a, of a heliade wind turbine and you can see how much it is compared to the um, to the people around it so uh, um, those are the two so we have four types of wind turbines based on their electrical configurations but we can also have two types of wind turbines based on the, um, the shaft types with gearbox and without a gearbox now, when we talk about the operational, uh, how, how a wind turbine is operated, the, the, the standard or the typical way of, of providing there or of showing that is by using the power curve method, which is a static representation uh, of the relation between the wind speeds on the x-axis and the power produced by a wind turbine. And here we can see that, of course, wind turbines, not they need a minimum uh, wind speed after which they can start rotating because they, they need to have the minimum aerodynamic power that will, will move the, the, the blade and start producing power and then there is a, a part of the of the power which is increasing with the cube of the wind speed the so-called power optimization zone and then at a certain wind speed we are hitting the power limitation zone and in this power in this power limitation zone is simply done because um, if we would continue to increase the power that could be extracted from the wind, and I remind you, this is the cube of the wind speed. If we continue extracting that, the the loads on the mechanical structure will be too 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 much. It will simply doesn't make sense to create a structure that that would with, with, withstand these forces. So then we are in the power limitation zone where even if the wind speed is increasing the power extracted from the wind turbine does not increase and this is an example for a two megawatt wind turbine but the the characteristic is is fairly similar to to all wind turbines uh, today so the power curve is is a very nice way to to illustrate the operational uh, zones of the of the wind turbines and the same what i didn't say is that there are uh, when the wind speed reaches very high, very high values, then the wind turbines are simply stopped to protect themselves from the from the mechanical um, from the mechanical loading. So, this is also maybe um, um, a thing that is a bit counterintuitive that stronger and stronger wind is actually not necessarily very good for the wind turbines, and they might end up even stopping uh, when the wind speed gets very high to protect themselves. Now. Going a bit uh, a bit deeper in the in the way the wind turbines are are uh, um, operated, we have the expression of the aerodynamic power, which is a function of the of course the wind speed, the air density, the rotor swept area, but also from the the, the constructive characteristic, the blade pitch angle, which is uh, you can see here the angle in between the the um, the wind speed and the the uh, how the, how the blade is 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 seen uh, by by the, by the wind speed, and of course then it's a function of the so-called power coefficient, the CP, which at 
most of the wind turbines, it's a function of the blade pitch angle, as I said, but also of the tip speed ratio. So the the, the tip speed ratio is the, the ratio between the speed at the tip of the of the blade of the wind turbine and um, and the wind speed and uh, um, as we can see here some of the things are constructive i mean or some of the things are related to wind speed which we don't control the other one are constructive or the rotor sweat swept area how how big the 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 sweeping area of the rotor is but also there are things that uh, we might be able to control and this is the pitch angle and the tip speed ratio or the the rotating speed of the of the machine so uh, um, by doing that uh, if we look at the power coefficient of the wind turbine, as I said, it is a function of the of the pitch angle and the tip speed. And if we plot um, if we plot the, the the surface of the characteristic of uh, the relation between the the CP angle here and uh, on on this axis and the pitch angle and the tip speed ratio, we see that um, uh, there is a surface over which uh, the CP is, is developing. And as we can see from, we see from the previous slide, we, what we want is always to have as high CP as possible. And the, the maximum value of CP, you can see maybe in the, in the graph that it, uh, it does not exceed uh, 0 0.5 in this example. And this is the so-called uh, Bates limit. Um, yes, in... Uh, in wind power, which basically tells us how much of the kinetic energy in the wind speed can be extracted by a wind turbine. And just to get a sense of that, if we would extract, uh, if this bed's limit would be 100%, would mean that behind the wind turbine, there is no wind speed. So the, all the wind is stopped by the by the wind turbine, which of course it's uh, it's not possible. And the bed's limit, uh, uh, it's it's 59% in theory, but I think in in practice is uh, is probably uh, more like uh, seventy five or uh, or uh, eighty percent of that, and that tells us how much uh, what is the efficiency or how much of the of the of the kinetic energy in the wind spin we can um, uh, we can extract, and that's might sound a little a little low, but it's not so bad if we if you remember I said earlier that this is actually a function of the of the cube of the wind speed. So, from a control perspective, we talked about the different wind turbine concepts from uh, from a constructive perspective, electrical topology, or having or not uh, gearbox. But from a from a control uh, perspective, we have the the rotor speed control. So we have the fixed speed wind turbines, which I showed you before, or the variable speed wind turbines and also fixed pitch or variable pitch wind turbines. And uh, hopefully, as I showed in the previous slide, being able to control the rotational speed and the pitch angle of the wind turbines also allows you to try to maintain the CP on the highest point of, of their of its uh, of its space. So always trying being able to to extract the maximum power from the from the wind turbine. So uh, a little in um, in a in a block diagram we have the uh, the control loops for a wind turbine are the the power the power loop which is uh, trying to control the power of the of the wind turbine and the pitch angle so it's controlling the pitch uh, the pitch uh, of the wind turbine um, to go a little more into into details from uh, from for a type 4 wind turbine as i said before the full uh, uh, variable speed wind turbine we have the the two control um, uh, loops one is the pitch control modifying the, the pitch of the blades. And then we have the control of the generator of the torque or the speed of the of the generator, which is done through the power electronics, the grid connected uh, power electronics. And there we can have, as we can see on this on this slide, uh, we don't have only the power control here, which uh, which controls the, the power extracted from the generator, but we also have the control of the grid side part of the converter where we can control uh, uh, we are controlling typically the dc link voltage so the voltage in the in the dc link between the two converters and on the grid side we can control the reactive power uh, typically the reactive power exchange with the uh, with the grid and all those are coming from the so-called uh, mppt maximum power point track control 
but it can also come, uh, as you see here below TSO, I think in, in at least in European uh, terminology, TSO is a transmission system operator. So is the is the entity that operates the power grid, uh, the power system in, uh, in 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 a given area, and they can also have reference towards the control of the wind turbines, typically done through the wind power plant controller. And then, of course, this this will go into the into the control loops of the wind turbines. Now, this is very briefly and uh, how how wind turbines are are controlled. But if we move now to the wind power plant control level, uh, let me first start with a definition of what a plant is: wind farm or plant. I think uh, this these terms are used a bit um, uh, a bit interchangeable. Talking about uh, about that and uh, wind farm or a plant is a collection of wind turbines which are connected to the public grid to the same point of connection. So first of all, they have one point of connection, the wind turbines, and second, which is maybe a bit more important, is that all the wind turbines in a wind farm or a wind plant are controlled in a coordinated manner, generally using a centralized controlling, also known as a wind farm plant control. So a wind farm or a wind plant is not only a collection of wind turbines that are geographically close to each other, but are ones that are controlled in a coordinated uh, manner. And just to the offshore wind farms in um, in the west coast of Denmark, uh, the Hornsrev one, which was built in 2003, and you can see it has 80 wind turbines and it has a very grid-based layout with uh, the wind turbines in a very symmetrical uh, way. Uh, a few years later, Hornsrev two was built, and you can see that we still have kind of a grid-based uh, layout, at least for the strings of the wind turbines, but the overall geography of the of the wind farm has changed and this is typically because of the wakes or the aerodynamic interaction because each one wind turbine interacts with the, the ones around it through the wind speed that goes to, that that passes them and goes to the one below and that's what we call the aerodynamic interaction between the wind turbines and finally the, the third one which was operational last year you can see that it's uh, it also has a much a rather more irregular uh, uh, layout and that's again because the, the wind turbines increase in size and their interaction with each other aerodynamically is increasing so the whole um, wind farms or wind plant layouts are are changing in time and while I don't have time to say much about it now this also has an influence on the electrical part and wind power plant controller because you have more and more cables that are uh, and longer uh, kilometers of cables installed in a, in a wind farm and that has an impact on the on the stability and the resonances and all kind of aspects related to a, uh, if you want a weak kind of AC network uh, offshore. Now coming back to the wind power plant control, as I said, the wind power plant control is uh, is the level uh, one level above the wind turbine level here uh, depicted here in this graph which we we talked before, but what is doing is is getting uh, uh, references external references from the grid side for example here and then using the measurements at the point of of common coupling uh, and then is dispatching the set points to the wind turbine and uh, the the main point here is that the wind power plant what it aims at is to have the whole the number of wind turbines which can be tens of wind turbines in in modern wind power plants to behave as a single unit as seen in the point of uh, of um, connection and it can we do that for for many reasons uh, some of them is to optimize responses like for the grid the frequency support but also as i said to um, to have a knowledge about how the wind turbines interact with each other and then uh, uh, minimize those um, those you know the collector losses or the wake interaction and by doing that you can also decrease the wind turbine mechanical loads and fatigue because each wind turbine only sees kind of the world around it but not what's happening in the in the big wind farm and then we can do for for different reasons but uh, if i stay with um, with the optimized response like a frequency support that is something that it's not really uh, seen as the wind speed or the power production, but is seen from the um, from the transmission system. And of course, uh, we have communication delays that need to take, be taken into account when we're talking about the power plant control. So, 
coming back on the on the optimized response a bit it's we're doing that because uh, um, wind power is is requested or, or needs to contribute to the uh, reliability of the of the power system and that uh, uh, that means that they should be able to provide uh, services or, or functions that will ensure or contribute to restoring the secure and stable operation of the power system and these specifications are typically uh, provided in uh, by grid codes and so-called grid codes and uh, power electronics they are not only enabling enabling the very large wind turbines as hopefully i try i showed you earlier but also greatly enhances their performance towards the grid code so they make them uh, more valuable seen from the system perspective and very very briefly what is a grid code grid codes are um, technical uh, specifications which defines which parameters a facility connected to a public electric grid has to meet to ensure safe secure and economic proper functioning of the electric system and they're typically uh, required behavior during system disturbances because the main point is to to to, to provide or to help during uh, system disturbance and they can include a lot of things maybe the more typical one is voltage regulation power factor limits and reactive power supply if you remember the q uh, control on the on the wind turbine uh, grid side converter but also responses to frequency changes on the grid so provide the balancing um in the in the grid but also responses to 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 to, to large transients in the system like a short circuit and the ability to write through those short interruption of the of the connection so a lot of the technical a lot of technical specifications are coming from the grid codes and they do have a, a significant uh, influence or impact on how wind power plants and wind turbines are are controlled and designed so seen from a wind turbine plant control capability i think uh, uh, wind turbines started as being uh, grid following which in this context means that they could maybe control their power active and reactive power but they will require to have an active grid a, a powered energized and operating grid with typically with high um, inertia and high source circuit ratio so a strong grid where they will just connect and provide the pnq uh, today we have moved to the part where they uh, they need wind turbines today and wind power plants are grid supporting so they are able to support not only control their power and and active and reactive power but actually control it in a way that will provide support to the grid in frequency and voltage they still require power grid so they are still grid following in that sense but by um, by enhancing their controllability they can connect and they are connecting today to to weaker grids with with lower inertia and uh, uh, just an example of that uh, is the fault right through requirements from wind the fault right through very quickly is uh, when uh, when uh, some component in the system typically transmission lines there is a fault for whatever reason that fault is then uh, um, is detected and and that line is is disconnected uh, but that means that you typically see a voltage a voltage drop and here's an example for the uk system with a fault location here and how the voltage drop is seen across the system so the larger from the, the larger the electrical distance from the fault then the drop in voltage that you will see is uh, is, is smaller of course and of, uh, even if these um, uh, faults are cleared very quickly the wind turbines should survive that where the from where the famous fault right through comes through and uh, so should stay connected during the fault but also they should actively participate in uh, in restoring the fault by by injecting fault current and uh, uh, again just to show how how these requirements have changed over time i think in the early 90s when we had the first recommendations for wind power in the nordic system a fault right through was not really mentioned so nobody was considered that wind power is important to, to participate in the in this fault right through and this has changed over time with uh, wind power being requested to to have more and more contributions doing that today uh, being all the way to to being able to provide negative sequent current to balance and detect asymmetrical faults so this has increased a lot uh, the the requirements on on wind on wind power to to provide uh, this kind of uh, security or, or reliability if you want services to them to the power system and this is um, 
expanding. This was a very brief example only to fold right through, but it's the same in, uh, in, in other areas. And I think what we are moving now towards is the wind turbines and wind power plants of tomorrow, which will be probably grid forming. So not only uh, support as before, but they actually be able to create and control the frequency and the voltage of the of the um, of the power system and that means that then they should they will be also able to operate in an islanded mode and in basically zero inertia system so uh, wind turbines can uh, will be requested to 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 move to a so-called grid forming um, philosophy of operation and uh, why we are doing that uh, or why do this will happen i think it's because we are uh, in the in the middle, or I don't know where, but we are right now a part of uh, of a fundamental uh, change of the power systems. And you can see here that, as you probably know, in the past the power systems were uh, comprised of a few large generating units, which were then uh, could be coal or nuclear, fossil fuels or hydro. But then we were those were supplying industrial loads and, and households. Uh, and then the system was kind of uh, more simple, fewer units doing that. Today, I think we have we are in a phase where uh, we still have um, fossil fuels or large conventional generation, but we have more and more renewable generations which have this main characteristic of not being directly connected to the grid, but being connecting through power electronics. So they're decoupled from the um, from the grid and if everything goes as, as planned i think we will be moving uh, sooner or later uh, hopefully sooner than later to a future where we will have uh, a very large share of of uh, uh, renewable uh, energy sources in the system which also will mean that most of the generation in the system then will be connected behind power electronics and that will uh, will mean that um, Power electronics should also have these grid forming capabilities. And of course, wind together with PV and maybe still hydro in the system will have to be the ones that we will not only connect to a grid, but actually create that grid and control that grid. And just to, to finish, uh, just to give you an, uh, uh, an idea that wind power actually today is extremely large. So uh, this is a very nice graph made by uh, uh, by a former PhD student in uh, in uh, in Europe, uh, where he uh, compared the Holmsi project one, which is the first gigawatt scale offshore wind farm uh, in the world, uh, built in North Sea in Europe, and is showing that the wind turbines that they are using one rotor revolution of this wind turbine can uh, power 25 houses for an hour, so only one rotation of the wind turbine. Then uh, the wind turbine wind farm capacity, as I said, it's 1.2 gigawatts, which uh, at a capacity, at a given capacity factor, can actually power uh, a million homes. And uh, yeah, in general, I think the electric cables length, the total electric cables that were, were used for this wind farm are representing uh, 381 kilometers, or if you want, the distance in a straight line between London and Amsterdam in, in Europe, and so on. And we can go on. Uh, with this, which I think it's also kind of funny and amazing in a way to to see that the blade tip speed can reach uh, um, can reach uh, velocities that are uh, tip, which are comparable for a Formula One racing car. So wind power is becoming extremely large in 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 all uh, in all senses. And with that, I will uh, have only uh, one. I will take only one a couple more minutes with my summary, which I want to say that. Uh, Wind turbines are very large, sophisticated machines. They're actually, I think today, they are the largest and most flexible rotating machines on Earth. And this development is, is continuing at a, at, a, at a key pace, but uh, a system integration of wind power is actually extremely important today. And uh, while the requirements for wind power are increasing, I think wind power has, in some ways, better control performances or better performances than conventional generators. And with that, I think I will stop here and say thank you, and I'll be very happy to, to get questions. So thank you so much, Professor Nicolas, for your amazing and informative lecture and very interesting talk. Let me all, uh, let me inform all audience uh, from the Malaysian around the world, you are welcome to post any relevant question here. 
If you are any question, can post into Prof. Nicholas in Facebook. Uh, I will I will read the, the question from the Facebook comments. So uh, to kick us our question answer section, uh, I begin one question from me first, Prof. Uh, actually, Prof, uh, the low frequency song, uh, for example, the uh, the range of around the 10 to 200 hertz, uh, which can uh, be heard by the human, including the ambient uh, air turbulence and remote explosion and traffic and aircraft and the other types of the machinery effect uh, uh, can uh, produce noise in the wind turbine. Uh, therefore, the leg uh, of any of these noise sources, such as the traffic, aircraft, and the machinery can help to eliminate this frequency. In addition, the COVID-19 and the lockdown uh, has reduced the noise source, uh, such as the traffic, resulting in the eliminate of the low frequency sound. Uh, I want to know, uh, can improving the wind turbine performance or not? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I understood correctly the question, but uh, noise from wind turbines is uh, uh, is a challenge, and actually the way we are controlling the tip speed of the of the of the blades of the wind turbines are, are mostly limited in terms of noise that are it's produced by the produced by the wind turbines. So uh, if if that was the direction of the of the question, yes. Um, a lot of work is done into the noise emission from wind turbines because I think, especially on onshore wind, the noise that that the rotation of the wind turbines makes is is a factor that makes people um, make people not you know a bit not very enthusiastic about having large wind turbines very close to to urban centers or to 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 areas where people live. Okay, thank you so much, Prof. Uh, we received uh, one question from Hassan Kabya, and uh, he said, uh, I think he had two questions. I think, I, think uh, I can see them. Uh, okay, okay. Can you read the question? Yes. So the first question is, if is wind power more expensive than other uh, uh, It's the LCOE of, of onshore wind, it's significantly cheaper than coal and other forms. Uh, maybe the maybe PV is is a bit cheaper than onshore wind, but uh, but both of them are am am among the cheapest um, forms of energy today. The second one with uh, can we use aluminium composite materials for the wind turbine blades? That's it's a bit outside my kind of my my area of expertise, but uh, I uh, as far as I know they are uh, they are not. They are not using aluminium composite for the for the blades because they are very large structures. The blades are very large. I think the largest blade today is over a hundred meter length, and that's probably structurally has. Uh, they would kind of need, I would guess, materials which have uh, which are stronger. But please bear in mind that I am more on the electrical part of the wind turbines than the the materials. So I hope I didn't say anything very stupid there. Thank you. I think we have one more question. Yes. Does one large wind turbine better than a few small wind turbines? That's that's not easy to answer because um, uh, one one aspect that I have not included here is uh, uh, the variability from wind. Yeah, wind speed is stochastic, so it, it will vary over time. And if you have one large wind turbine. The variation of the wind wind speed will have a bigger impact on the power produced. But if you have uh, more smaller wind turbines, which are more distributed geographically, this distribution will smoothen this variability. So from that perspective, uh, smaller wind turbines are better. But from a, from a cost perspective, one large wind turbine will probably mean a lower cost of energy uh, overall. So uh, it's it's not an yes no answer. It's it depends a bit on 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 the context, but hopefully I I gave you a few points on on um, uh, on on this. Thank you so much for, for yes. your response. Uh, I think we have one more question. Yes, I think wind turbines today are are uh, very good in providing uh, reactive power. I haven't shown here, but there is uh, uh, the the grid code requirements is that the wind turbines are be are able to provide um, up almost up to to one per unit 
uh, reactive power at uh, at full power. So uh, they are very very good in in supplying reactive power, and they do that uh, constantly. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Long effect, long term effect. Well, hopefully, one long term effect is to reduce CO two emissions in uh, in our in our energy system. Uh, uh, and and move us to uh, to a way of of uh, generating uh, or producing our our electricity that is uh, much more renewable and sustainable than uh, than fossil fuels. Thank you, Pro. I think we have more questions from the audience. I appreciate yeah, if I'm, you prepare to this I'm question. Very, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Of course, I'm very happy to 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 talk about them. Um, I think vertical axis wind turbines have some advantages over the horizontal. I would I would agree with that. But uh, I think, and again, I'm not a structural engineer. But uh, again, I think, as far as I know, the main issue with um, with uh, with the um, vertical axis wind turbines are the vibrations, and this is a, 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 an important, significant issue that, as far as I know, has not been solved yet. So I think vertical axis wind turbines they are still limited by, by, by the vibration uh, issues of them rotating around around their axis. But there, there are a lot of, there's a lot of research into that, but uh, I don't think they are, they are close to, 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 you know, become uh, very, very important in the in the near future. Thank you so much uh, for your reply. And uh, I think due to limited time, we have to finish this lecture. And if the viewers have more questions, can just email later to Prof. Nicholas. Yes. Uh, thanks again, Prof. Now uh, I pass to Prof. Rafael to closing remarks. Thank you, Dr. Amereza, for you, Prof. the session and introduce Prof. Nikolaos Kutululis. And to our distinguished speaker today, Prof. Nikolaos Kutululis, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Thank you so much for sharing uh, all the stuff about wind power and wind energy. And thank you again for entertaining all the questions from our audience. And to all our audience around the globe, and uh, we have more than 200 unique viewers uh, in this particular DLS. So it's good to have uh, a lot of viewers for our session. And to all of you, thank you for watching UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. Do stay tuned because we have many more interesting lectures for you. Until next time, bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you and bye-bye. Stay thank safe. You. Bye. you too.